So um, overall goal here is, um, Nicola's gonna talk a little bit about the, the pod fund, but I wanna explore the intersection of creators, business models, and how creators are financed, because I think that's something we don't cover often enough at Design Driven. So just give you a sense that's where we're ahead. Um, but I wanna start first by exploring the depth and breadth of the podcasting industry, which is where you spend your time. So I was wondering if you could just give us a little sense of how big podcasting has gotten over the past few years. Yeah, so um, at, I guess the, the latest stats are about 50% of Americans or 140 million um, have ever listened to a podcast, um, and 32% have listened in the past month. Um, and a lot of that growth, and it's been growing steadily every, every year, and a lot of that growth is actually happening in the like 12 to 24 age group. Um, so it's pretty interesting, because I think that the... Um, the sort of the reputation that podcasting has, I think, is with the, that it's an older audience, but actually growth is happening with younger folks. Um, so, yeah, it's, but if you put that in perspective, I, actually, I don't have the stat, what, you have a radio stat that compare, I think it's like three to, three times as big, basically, three times as many people, 260-ish or something, a million Americans listen to radio every month. So, um, on the one hand, you know, one in every two people, but on the other hand, it's still pretty small compared to other mediums. That's big. And um, <clears throat> what about in terms of revenue? Like how much uh, money does podca uh, podcasting and podcasters generate over the past couple of years? Uh, so I think it was about half half a billion in 2018, um, which was 50% over the previous year. And then um, I think it's just over a billion by 2021. Um, but again, super small compared to a lot of these other mediums. Awesome. Uh, and then out of curiosity, who in the room doesn't listen to podcasts? We got, I saw two hands for the record. So, okay, we're, we won't single you out, but thank you for being so brave. Um, uh, How many have listened in the past week to a podcast? That's a lot of people. Great. <laughs> uh, and from your standpoint, who are the most important players in the podcasting ecosystem historically and today? Well, I think the, the the probably the biggest players are the apps, um, and really Apple, especially in the U.S. It's a little bit different internationally, just based on like cell phone, what kinds of cell phones people use. But in the U.S., um, it's about sixty five percent Apple market share. But Spotify is is nipping at their heels, and is um, I think the latest that's there is that Spotify's um, podcast audience has grown fifty percent over last year. So. They're increasingly growing, but they pretty much control all the distribution. There are a bunch of other apps, but um, the majority of the listening is happening on those two. Um, and uh, yeah, the Apple also, not just in dist distributing, but as like a directory, they sort of control all the discovery. Um, they're the creators and the publishers, dominated again by larger media companies. Um, hosts and um, the actually SoundCloud is the, the biggest and then um, Libsyn and then Anchor I think is, um, which is owned by Spotify now, um, is it accounts for 30% of all new podcasts. So they're also growing really quickly and I think have definitely contributed to as part of like a broader ecosystem of, of tools, um, made it easier to create podcasts and get them out to audiences, um, advertisers, um, sellers of advertising, um, obviously listeners, and then like platforms, tools, services that sort of support like the Patreons and um, Glows, Descript, all of the editing software, et cetera. But, um, but when you think of podcasting, like and who's really throwing their weight around, yeah, the, the players definitely have a lot of the power. And then uh, last just general framing question is, uh, how do you make money in podcasts? Yeah, um, <laughs> there are a bunch of different business models, but um, by far and away, Advertising is the primary source of revenue. I think about um, uh, because we're we work with creators. I think primarily from the perspective of a creator, like how does a podcast creator make money? And um, yeah, advertising is the is the chief form. Um, but there are increasingly more options for direct monetization. There are um, membership models where you can um, allow people to subscribe, um, not in the normal subscribe, and that's a whole other conversation about um, com confusion around what it means to subscribe and whether you have to pay to subscribe on Apple Podcasts to a podcast. But there actually are membership subscription products where podcasters can sell um, 
um, membership for extra perks or whatever. Um, there's listener support and donations. Patreon is sort of straddles that line. Um, there's tipping. There's live events. There's merch. There's licensing. All of those, though, are are still pretty rare. I mean, Patreon is is a pretty big platform at this point and is probably the only other um, significant kind of form of monetization. But advertising is is kind of the the key one. And then as we were getting ready for this, we did a back of the envelope ca uh, calculation just so everyone knows. Yeah. So a CPM, that's the cost per thousand listeners for a podcast, is about $20, which means that if you have 500,000 downloads, 25 episodes a year, and three ad spots per podcast, you're looking at about $750,000 a year in revenue. Is that about right? That is about right, although I'll... I'll I'll do you another. Okay. Just let's do math <laughs> in front of lots of people. Um, uh, well, the, so um, there is a uh, Andreessen Horowitz, the another venture capital firm. Never heard of them. Yeah, yeah, not as good as yours. Uh, <laughs> they put out like a seventy-page deck on the industry, and um, one of the slides, among among other things, one of the slides which showed the average monetization of an active user per hour compared to all the different meetings, back to our earlier point. And podcasting is at like a cent per active user per hour. Um, radio is like 11 cents. Magazines and newspapers are up there like almost like 50 cents. But um, but yeah, it's compared to the internet even, I think it's like 24 cents. So it's just podcasting is literally at the bottom, um, which is surprising actually because advertising on podcasts is actually pretty effective. But besides that, so there's that's one point. But the other is, so I'll... I'll do a different, the other slide was um, that only 1% of podcasts out there get more than 35,000 downloads an episode. Um, so uh, think about all the other 99%. So let's just take the 35,000. So if you had a 35,000 download an episode podcast and you had a $20 CPM and uh, you had, it was weekly, let's say it was weekly, um, and you sold 100% of your inventory, um, you would be looking at, $100,000 a year. So again, think about the other 99% of all of the podcasts are making less than $100,000 a year. Um, and that's assuming that you sell 100% of your inventory. And I, mean, I think we were both working on a four ads per episode kind of assumption. But that's if you sold every single ad, which never happens. And that's assuming that you took home all of the revenue. And most of the time, um, folks are not selling their own advertising. They're working with an, uh, a network or um, a distribution partner who's taking anywhere between 15 to 50% of that. So you're not actually taking home 100,000, and more likely you're the one of the 99% making far less than that. So you're saying you shouldn't start a podcast? Is that <laughs> that's the advice? That, I guess I'm saying that 500,000 downloads an episode, like, I don't know, yeah, you're in pretty rarefied air. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, so let's talk about PodFund. What is PodFund? So PodFund is um, the first and really the only independent, dedicated source of funding and advisory for podcast creators, or as we like to say, audio-first creator-led media companies. <laughs> um, because they are the creators come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. Um, does that answer your question? That's I can keep going. Answers the question. Um, and what prompted you to start it? Like, give us a little bit of the story yeah. behind PodFund. Um, so my partner, um, Jake Shapiro, was the, the CEO for 15 and the co-founder for 15 years of a company called PRX, um, which is a technology and distribution platform. And, um, and then he ended up spin, spinning out a company called Radio Public, which has um, a listening app, but also increasingly focuses on tools and services to help podcasters monetize and grow their audience. Um, and, but um, PodFund is sort of a, a further extension of that core mission to help podcasters succeed and build profitable, sustainable businesses, um, we saw, you know, kind of a, a, an explosion of creators, new shows, um, emerging studios, and they were all facing similar challenges, um, steep learning curve, how do I do this, like, where, where, where's the playbook, um, lack of tools, they're, they're still, it's still a young medium, um, and a lot, no access to growth or startup capital. And there was a ton of investment actually coming in to um, some of the platforms and the startups, but not really to the creators individually, um, to, to the ones who are making the content. And so we saw this gap and, we're, and, and really want to try and help the other 99% get on the map and make a living. Um, there's so much good content, but so few people can actually do it and you know, pay rent. Um, and, uh, and it's really hard to get, uh, to break through the noise. And so we wanted to help with 
um, not just capital, but also the advisor trying to get people to that next level um, to try and even the playing field a little bit. Right. And suppose I'm an audio first, what would you Creator say? Creator-led media company? Yes. Okay. I'm a podcaster. Uh, what, do I, uh, what do I need the financing for? I mean, I, yeah. Outside of equipment and uh, you know, some production costs? The two uh, most common uses of funds are capacity. So um, in some cases, that might mean increasing the publishing cadence, which is one of the huge levers in that revenue potential. Like if you're weekly versus monthly, obviously that has an order of magnitude on, on what kind of revenue potential. So increasing the ability to, to put out content, which might mean you know being able to go full time or um, hire extra help. Um, or it might mean starting an ex another show, like an, an extension, building out your studio. Um, and the other is marketing. Uh, it's, it's, as we've sort of touched upon, it's, and I think we will later, uh, it's hard out there to get noticed and to get on the map. And so um, even though there are a lot of these shows, depending on what, what kinds of stories they're telling and, and what their process is, um, can be, you know, profitable and cash producing, but they don't necessarily have the cash flow to drop, you know, tens of thousands of dollars on marketing. And so that's where PodFund can kind of help. So capacity and marketing are probably the two most common uses. Awesome. And uh, I think to me, the most interesting question I'm going to ask you tonight is this question. How do you decide which creators to back? Because you're making a bet on a person, you're making a bet on a concept. So what signals do you look for? Is it is it the medium? Is it the length? Is it a niche that's been unexplored? Is it the person? Yeah, I think, well, first, um, we. I, I mean, it, it's sort of both the content and it's the business, the underlying business. You know, we are, we want to support creators, but we also have, everyone has a boss. And so uh, we have investors that are hopefully, hoping that we'll make good investment decisions that will generate returns. And so, um, one of the filters is, is this a, is this a viable business opportunity? Uh, and so we look at the publishing cadence, like how many episodes a year, what are the CPNs, what are the sell through rates, all of those kinds of things, or are they diversifying their revenue? Have they found a way to make money outside of the traditional CPM advertising, um, structure? Um, but are they, do they have, a, a interesting background that's related to the story that they're telling? Do they have um, entrepreneurship experience? Do they have a vision? Um, are they tenacious, curious? Um, all the kind of things that we would look at as, as venture capitalists when we're investing in, in startup founders. Um, and an understanding of the industry and, and creative talent. So kind of all of those things um, in addition to can this thing actually make money? Is this a good place for us to put ours? And uh, you hinted at something which was uh, folks finding alternative ways to monetize their podcasts outside of advertising. Um, what have you seen folks doing that's interesting and different um, way to monetize, monetize their audience? Um, I don't know that I've seen anything that, you know, knocked me out of my seat. But, <laughs> but I would say that diversification of revenue is, is, a, is smart and... Um, as long as it doesn't get too distracting. But I've seen lots of, of um, creators that are able to sell advertising on a flat fee instead of CPM, um, where on a CPM basis they would make far less. And so if you can do that, well done. Uh, but also, I've, I've gone to a, um, a podcast live show and seen creators come on stage and you'd think it was a rock concert, you know, 350 people at the Bell House just losing their minds. Um, and so... Uh, I think to the extent you can create a brand and, can, and any opportunity you can um, create a deeper relationship with your audience um, beyond just talking at them through an RSS feed, I think is an opportunity to like build lasting value and, um, and loyalty with you know, listeners who are more or less the customers. I've seen Radio Lab live three times, so guilty. Um, what are your favorite podcasts these days? Um, I have, I have, this is hard. I have a few that I like that I, that are actually daily. Um, there, I mean, I, I listen to the daily, like all the other 2 million people every day. Um, and, uh, there's a show called, 
Encyclopedia Womanica um, from a company called Wonder Media Network that every day does a five minute episode highlighting um, a famous woman from history and just talking about what she's done. Um, what else? I like, there's a show called The Unmistakable Creative. We invested in them uh, and they interview the creator um, Srini interviews everyone from bank robbers to billionaires. He, he had a great interview with Andrew Yang that I listened to. It was a few months ago. And at the time, I was like, this guy just keeps dropping F-bombs. Is he really <laughs> running for president? But it, it now totally makes sense. Um, I like Radiolab. Um, I like Invisibilia. Um, I like lots of shows. I don't know. Awesome. Thank to think you. Of other ones. Call Your Girlfriend. Oh, also, I listen to Election Ride Home, which is another daily podcast where you can just follow the ups and downs. Election Ride Home? Election Ride Home, okay. yeah. All right, good. Uh, I guess the last top topic I want to explore before you open it up for Q&A is um, distribution. So you've got a podcast. You started to build an audience. You know, you maybe uh, built a couple thousand loyal uh, fans. How do you grow? How do you break out of the noise? What, what, have, what have people done to, you know, cut into that top 1% that you mentioned earlier? Yeah, the, it, it's really hard. Dis discovery is kind of broken, and uh, there isn't a silver bullet. Um, I would say to, well, yeah, one of the things, I mean, there's sort of, a, I think you need to find your community of, of listeners, like where they are already, and if you can, try and, again, like I, applying a startup mentality, kind of like hack your your liquidity, <laughs> um, like find find people where they are and see if you can hack like a Facebook group and and help them bootstrap your audience. There are some curators that do a good job, like New York Mag, AV Club, um, Bello Collective, The Listener, lots of places that are you know we are actually our sister company has a podcast librarian, the first ever um, that does a lot of like curation, um, and then. It's sort of been proven, and this is part of like Wondery's playbook, is um, it's so much easier to convert an existing podcast listener, one of the you know 50% of Americans who are listening to podcasts already, um, to, find, to listen to your podcast. It's much harder to convince someone, well, first explain to them what a podcast is, and then ask them to listen to yours. And so um, promotions on other podcasts is dollar for dollar the most efficient if you're going to spend on marketing. Um, but... Even if you don't have a marketing budget, swaps are, are pretty common. And so shows with similar audience sizes will often um, trade like shout outs uh, or in some cases feed drops or even more sort of integrated. Uh, and those are kind of the best tricks, I think. But it's really hard. Uh, that's fascinating. And, and if the... you can get like a celebrity to tweet about <laughs> it, also do that. <laughs> Always a good technique. Yeah. The other, the other dynamic I've heard about is it's kind of a hits driven business. So if you build up a catalog of 20, 30 episodes and then you have one that just breaks out, what happens is you capture a bunch of new listeners that go binge back on the legacy content, which I think you said earlier doesn't apply to every category necessarily. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't, yeah. If you're sports or news, that's, it's a little bit more difficult. It's unlikely that people are going to go back and listen to your commentary about a game that happened four months ago. But, um, but yeah, if you have that catalog, the other thing that's kind of tricky back to the monetization, monetization part is, um, I think like 60, 60, 65% of ads are host read slash like baked in. And so even if they go back, you may not be able to monetize that back catalog listening. Um, but at least hopefully they'll get hooked and then they'll listen to all your future monetizable content. <laughs> So I think we've said the word monetize enough for one night. I'd uh, love to open up to uh, questions from the audience. And uh, I think we have Jack running the mic again. Yeah. Share your awesome. deepest questions on podcasting. Hi. Um, I was just really curious about how intellectual property rights work in a podcast. Uh, I mean, I imagine that I could uh, hear you kind of, uh, I mean, not to dumb that down, but kind of add some indie words and make it like my own version in India. So what would that look like? It does that affect the model? Sorry, the, can you repeat the question? Like, the, How does intellectual property works in a podcast? Does it affect the business? Yeah, I mean, I think that certainly the way we think about it from pod, for PodFund, we want to make sure that everyone that we invest in owns their feed and owns their show. Um, it kind of depends on what the show is. Um, Again, for like sports and news, it, the IP is a little bit more difficult um, of an example. But to, if you can create a brand um, 
or like a concept like the way that How Stuff Works has been able to sort of extend that brand to multiple different shows. Um, that's kind of an IP. And then increasingly, you're also seeing a lot of audio dramas getting um, converted into TV and film properties. And so in that way, it sort of works the same way that a book might, where there is, you know, a, a, a story, a concept, a title, um, and potentially characters, you know, that all can be extended to different medium. Awesome. I have one while we wait for another person to raise their hand. Awesome. Um, what's the most common piece of advice you find yourself giving to young podcasters? Uh, I would say to approach uh, the podcast, assuming that it's not just an art project or a hobby, but and, and the goal is actually to make it um, a sustainable endeavor, to treat it like a business. Like know who your listener is, know everything about them, actually have like a target persona, know where they are, what they are listening to, what they're interested in, and actually ask um, a lot. We love to see folks who are who do listener surveys to find out, like, is this the first podcast you've ever listened to? How did you find out about us? Um, and then and know how and when you're going to make money um, and have a plan for that. And it's very rare, in fact, that, I, that I'll see folks who have a plan for or have thought about um, how much money they might be able to make, even doing one of some of those back of the envelope, um, totally not prepared um, calculations that we did up here. Uh, they're they're you know doable, and so you know treat it like a business and and know what your like sort of goals and milestones are. Experiment, measure, experiment, measure, all that. Hi, I'm a big fan of uh, Stay Tuned with Preet, and I think he's done a great job of jumping into newsletters. Uh, and I've seen people like Joe Rogan; they do videos as well. And so what other mediums do you think are really accessible to people who start a podcast? Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, and I've uh, also, um, the ca Cafe um, Insider, which is Preet's membership, is like a great example, one of the best examples of a really successful membership model. Um, I think like online communities, I, there are a few tools that have popped up, like Mighty Networks is one where there, are, and, and some people use like um, Discord or, uh, I think there's another one called Flick, uh, where there are communities of people. Um, sometimes people are doing this on Facebook as well. Um, there is a great podcast that I love called Bodies um, that was on KZRW and uh, about sort of unexplained um, health issues. And she created this um, private Facebook group where people were sharing their own stories. And it sort of became this support network of these listeners for each other. And it was this really beautiful thing that I think developed, again, what we were saying earlier, like deep, deep loyalty and attachment to this um, concept, to the host, um, for like enabling those kinds of connections, not just between the host and the, and the listeners, but the listeners to each other. Then I guess uh, last question for you. You've, I think, already invested in a number of podcasts. Love to give you a chance to um, advertise for them quickly. Uh, could you just describe one or two of the, the podcasts that you've backed? Yeah. Um, so I talked about The Unmistakable Creative. Another daily show I like is um, a show called The Newsworthy. That's when I, I sort of like it as a compliment to The Daily because it's, it sort of has a pretty wide breadth and it's only about 10 minutes a day. Um, so that's a good one. And it's every morning at like 6 a.m. A um, company called Kerning Cultures that has... Uh, stories from the Middle East and diaspora. They have a new show called All Empire that also just came out. Um, and Sarah Jessica Parker just just Instagrammed about it. She just came across them. So if, if you could, again, if you can get someone like that to do it, great. Um, uh, we have a new show, a new um, company called Dive Studios. A, a few different um, new music-related ones. Um, it's two. It's three brothers who, one of whom is a K-pop star. Uh, and he has a, a show that just launched a couple months ago and within like a few weeks was number one on the music category in, in, um, in uh, Apple Podcasts. Uh, it's called K-pop Debak with Eric Nam, um, if you're into K-pop. Um, we're also investors in Jacob Weisberg and Mal Malcolm Gladwell's company Pushkin Industries, which has a ton of shows like Revisionist History and Against the Rules and Broken Record. Um, Disgraceland uh, by Jake Brennan, which is like a rock and roll, true crime uh, show. All of these are really good. But they're all, most, I think seven of the 11 investments that we've done so far are listed publicly on the Podfund website, which is podfund.com or pod.fund, whichever you like. <laughs> Sign up now. Well, Nicola, thank you so much. That was and awesome. And if, if you have a successful podcast, you can also apply for pod funding <laughs> at our website. I love it. Thank you so much. Yeah, really you. appreciate it.